celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. Weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away. You may be seated. Does anybody have any prayer requests this evening? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Amen. Brother Doyle. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, Miss Cotton. Anybody else? Okay. Brother Redmond, will you please pray for these needs and for tonight's service? Well, good evening, everybody. Glad you guys are here. You can probably pull me down a little bit because I'll project a little bit more than this. But um, one of the things I like to do is argue with atheists online. I, it's a hobby, and I just enjoy it. Um, I've, I've got a gift, I think, you know, of doing it. And uh, 
but I, it, when I started out, I, my life was rocked when I went to Bible college and I moved to California and I worked at a Bank of America. I was a bank teller and I, the guy next to me, his name was Eric and he was a um, atheist, hardcore atheist. He is just rocking my world. And he says things, this is one we're going to talk about tonight. He said, you know, Jesus never even claimed to be God. He said, can you show me in the New Testament? And I struggled. And his question was very pointed. And he does, he, they do this on purpose. So what I want you to do is, do y'all, I know some, we're going to talk through this tonight. But can you guys, if someone were to come to you and say, can you show me where Jesus said these words, I am God? Can you show anybody in, in the Bible where, where that phrase, he uses that term? No. Um, well, what we're going to do is to show you what he did say and why it, he did claim his divinity, both from his own mouth and from other people's writings in their own mouths. And it, just because you take this, that one little phrase uh, does not mean that he did not claim divinity. He did claim divinity. So what they do is they try to back you into a corner by taking one small phrase and they totally ig ignore the entire corpus of the Bible, the body of the Bible, of everything that's said in Old and New Testament, because Jesus quoted a lot of things that God the Father said in the Old Testament, and he brought it over into the New Testament. So, we're going to talk about the pre-existence of Christ, the life of Christ, and you cannot start studying the life of Christ if, if you're just going to study uh, starting from his birth. You guys with me? Say, uh-huh. Do you know that the second person in the Trinity was never born? The second person, God the Father, God the Son, he's the second person in the Trinity, and God the Holy Spirit. The second person in the Trinity was never born. He has always been the second person in the Trinity. Come on now. That's a fact. He has always been. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, okay? Jesus had no beginning. Now, that's the, as the second person of the Trinity. Jesus, the man, had a beginning when he humbled himself, when he did not feel like it was, uh, that it, it was he had to grasp on to his equality with God, the book of Hebrews says. He did not feel like the equality with God was so much that he had to grab, hold on to it too tightly. He let it go and he humbled himself and became a man even and submitted even to death on a cross. He, that, the, the man Christ Jesus obviously had a beginning, but the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, had no beginning. He was preexistent. John 1.1 1, 1 proves that. We're going to have a lot, so you guys are going to have to turn your Bibles. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. And the Word was with God, and real close, the Word was, the Word was God. It, the biggest way to prove the deity of Jesus is just to go to John chapter 1 and verse 1. The Word, now it doesn't say the man it says, in the beginning was the Word, the second person of the Trinity, right? The Word was with God, and the Word actually was God. They're one and the same. He was in the beginning with God, verse 2 says. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Go down to verse 14. And the word became flesh. This is what we talked about just a second ago. That second person of the Trinity humbled himself, did not feel like equality with God was something that he had to hold on to tightly, the Bible says. He let go of that and he humbled himself to become a man. And he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if you study the life of Christ, you can't begin with just his birth because he was very busy before his birth, very, very busy. So who is Jesus? Number one, he's the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 22. Go all the way to the end of your Bible. Revelation 22, it's just before your concordance. It says this, verses 12 through 17. Jesus is speaking. 
He says, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Secondly, Jesus claims this. He's the everlasting father. Isaiah chapter nine, go all the way over to the Old Testament. Isaiah nine, verse six through seven. says this, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. I love this. The zeal or the passion of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He's going to make sure it happens just out of his own passion and love. He's going to make sure it happens. He is the everlasting father, the Bible says. Thirdly, there's seven of these, so we're going to hustle. Thirdly, he's the creator of the universe. Did you guys know that Jesus is the creator? He is the speaker of the worlds. That's pretty impressive. He speaks into existence, and it happens. Not only does he, does, did he speak the world into existence, the Bible says that he holds everything together. Everything is in him, and he holds it all together by his power. This is my, one of my favorite uh, books, probably my favorite book in the New Testament, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and, in, did you, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Think about that. Did you understand? Not only did he, did he create everything on earth, what else did he create? Everything in heaven. <laughs> Think about that. Everything that's in heaven, he did it. Everything that's on earth, he did it. Repl Self-replicating cells, he designed them. DNA, he designed them. All things were created through him and for him. All because he wants it. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. That, we'll just go through 17 right there, all right? He is the creator not only of the universe, but of heaven, okay? Fourth, he's always been. John 17, verses one through five. John chapter 17, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. I love this. Do you realize that each, each person of the Trinity, it's one God, three separate entities, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and all they do is point to the other. Every one of them humbles himself before the other. Every one of them points to the other one. It's beautiful. Servant leadership. And Jesus says that I wanna glorify you. And God the Father says, I wanna glorify you. <laughs> you know, as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Verse three, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus is speaking these words. Verse four, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. He's talking to the Father. And verse five, underline this, your Bibles. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus is claiming deity right there. He's claiming that he had no beginning before the world was. And we're gonna delve a little bit deeper into that. Turn to Genesis chapter one, all the way over, first book. Genesis chapter one, first chapter. Then God said, and circle this in your Bible, let us, 
make man in our image. Who's he talking to? I mean, there's no people at this time, so who's he talking to? The Trinity is talking to themselves. Let us make man. If we're in the image of God and we're, we are a, a, a flesh, spirit, and soul, there's a reason why we have a triune nature, which is different than a normal animal, any other mammal or any other normal animal, which is why we can speak and sing and worship and nothing else can. It's because we're made in the image of God. God is talking to himself and he says, level. Verse seven says, come, let us go down. He's, again, they're communing with themselves, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we're gonna confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Number four, he has always been. All you have to do is to look at what Jesus has said about himself. And then when he talked to the two men on the road of Emmaus, he was talking about how that they've read the scriptures. He said, if you've read the scriptures, they talk about me. They talk about me. Deuteronomy chapter six, go to that one. Fifth book, verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word one is ehad, E-H-A-D, and it's a compound unity, one made up of others. It's multiple in one. The world or lending of a cherub. Cherubim, you had an Elohim, which is a plural in unity and in oneness of God. That's how he described himself. This word has a plural ending, and I am is plural. The Lord our God is one, and that is true, but he's also three in one. Number five, he holds all things together, and he sustains all things. He, verse 15, we read this just a minute ago. We're just gonna read through 17 this time. He is the image of the invisible God. How many of you got a quarter in your pocket? Anybody got a quarter you can bring up to me real quick? Glenn, hustle. Bring it up to me. You don't have one? Somebody need to get Glenn some money. I'm gonna take a love offering at the end. Who's got a quarter? Thank you, brother. Cody's got one. He's, a, he's got it. Thank you, bro. You may never see this again. <laughs> That's why Glenn didn't want to give it. All right. This right here is 25 cents. It's a quarter. It's a, it's a part of the U.S. monetary system. Everybody in this room has seen one. Who is on the, who's the picture? in this front of the quarter. If there is an oddity or something that happens, it's like one in a million shot or one in some crazy outlandish number of something happened in the pressing. That word image, that he is the image of God is the Greek word for how these are made. He's the image of the invisible God. In other words, they take the invisible God and they made an image and it's Jesus. It's Jesus' image. That's what that, that means. So when you look at this quarter, if it were Jesus' image, you would be looking at God is what Colossians is saying. It's the same thing they would use in the Roman times. They would, they would stamp Caesar's uh, image on a coin. That word is what is used in the Greek word. That, that It's the stamping. It is the certificate of approval that this is Caesar. And they're using it as for Jesus. This is God. The image that you see with Jesus is who God is. It's what God looks like. Thank you for the quarter, Cody. I'll give it back someday. Verse 16, we're gonna read it again. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions and principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He holds all things together, number five, and he sustains all things. Number six, he did claim to be God. He did make a claim to be God. Did you know 81 times the phrase son of man is used in the four gospels? Son of 31 of them, or 30 times, just Matthew alone. Why was Matthew, why was that such an important 
uh, thing to, to let you guys know that Matthew 30 times, Jesus used the, the phrase son of man about himself is because it was written to Jews. Matthew was written mainly to Jews from a Jewish perspective, okay? The son of man is a Jewish perspective phrase. We hear it. When I was a little kid, I'd go, well, that's weird. I'm a son of man. That doesn't prove anything. All of us are technically sons of men, you know? Um, but that is a Jewish phrase. We're going to read, read about that in just a second. Mark 8, 38. Jesus says these powerful, cutting words. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... Of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. So when you read that, you're like, well, that doesn't prove anything. Tim, son of man means nothing. I don't even know what that means. But every Jew who reads that, every Jew who is biblically literate understands exactly what that means. Because in Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 and 14, you're going to hear what Daniel the prophet writes about this son of man. Verses 13 and 14 says, Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man, all caps, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, I love this, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. The Son of Man is, is talking about the authority of God himself. Every time Jesus uses that phrase, to us it is seemingly innocuous and innocent and means nothing to us, but to every Jew, which is who he came for originally, when he, he looked over the hill in Jerusalem and he said, how I have longed to take you under my wing like a mother hen does her, her chicks, but you would have none of me. He's understanding that they've rejected him. That's who he came for. He came for his own, his own received him not. So when he used that term, son of man, he used it so many times through the gospels, it's because he was talking to the Jews that they would understand who he is. Any biblically literate Jew would understand what that reference means. And any biblically, we have become, at one point in America, we were a very biblically literate country. Say, "Uh uh-huh. We have turned into a very biblically illiterate country. I'll give you an, an unbelievable example. And it comes from Daniel. During World War II, um, in in, uh, Europe, the European theater, the English army was surrounded by the Germans, okay? And I'm not sure if this was Dunkirk or what this was. I don't remember the exact battle. So look it up, Google this, this is true. They're surrounded. The German leader writes a note to the English general And he says, if you will uh, surrender, we will take you as prisoners and we won't kill you. And the English general writes back three words. Do you know what those three words are? There were three words that was the front page of the New York Times, the Washington Post, every... um, London Times, Telegraph, every newspaper in Europe and America had these three words on the very top two-inch headlines, and it said, but if not. And every person in America knew exactly what that phrase came from in 1940-something, 80 years ago. Every person in America knew what that, that's all the general wrote, but if not. Sealed it, sent it off to the courier. The German read it. He knew exactly what it meant. The newspapers wrote it. They knew exactly what it meant. The Americans picked up the newspaper paper that day, saw the three words, knew exactly what it meant. I would venture to guess that not 1% of America today would know what those three words meant or represented. And I would say less than half in this room know. It comes from Daniel. And it is the story of the fiery furnace. That's what this comes from. And Nebuchadnezzar had commanded them to bow down 
surrender or be thrown into this unbelievably hot and painful and horrible death. And those three Israelite children or young men looked at Nebuchadnezzar and they said, we believe that the Lord can save us, but if not, we will never bow to you. And this is what the English general said to the German general. Basically, he really took that story down to three little words and said, we believe, basically said, we believe that God can save us and rescue us, but if not, we'll never surrender. You're gonna have to kill us. You're gonna have to kill us. When Jesus used the phrase son of man, he was using it for people who were biblically literate of the Old Testament, and these were the Jews, and this is who he came for. These were his people. He came to his own. They did not receive him, but he came to them, and he spoke their language, and he talked to them about Old Testament things, and he talked to them about the Father, and he said, if you've read the Old Testament, you've read about me because it speaks of me. This is the literacy that he's talking about when he uses the phrase son of man and it's so powerful and poignant. Every Jew knew what son of man meant and that this was a claim of being God. In short, the son of man has the divine authority of God. He is the son of the living God. He is seated at the right hand of the father and all authority is given to him. Which is why at the end of Mark's gospel, When Jesus is asked, who are you? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus says in Mark chapter 14, he says this, two simple words, I am. Now, if you were to go through the Old Testament and someone were to try to corner you and say, well, did God even claim to to be God? To use those words, I am God. God called himself God many times in the Old Testament. There's only one God. There's no gods before me, et cetera, et cetera. That's often. But when he introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush, he used these two words, I am. He didn't have to finish everything else. (laughs) It was pretty much known to Moses, I am. Jesus uses those words. And you will see the son of man sitting, and again, he uses that son of man phrase, sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. And this is where the high priest, the Jews heard this and they respond, you've heard the blasphemy. Did he claim, did he say the actual words, I am God right there? No, but he blasphemed. How did he blaspheme? Because he used the words I am and he used the phrase son of man again was blasphemy to them because they knew Son of Man was the Messiah, was the Son of the living God, that everything was given to him, all dominion and power and authority was given to him, and his kingdom will never, ever end, what Daniel teaches. And then lastly, and my favorite one, the thing that is, makes him the most beautiful is that he is the life changer. Jesus is the life changer. John chapter eight, verse 12 says, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In other words, he's saying, when I come into someone, when I resurrect a dead man, they're different. When I resurrect somebody from the dead, which is the greatest miracle that can ever be done, the salvation of a person is the greatest miracle you will ever see. It's a slap in the face of God when we want to pray about how tough and difficult cancer healings are. He would rather show his power in a six-year-old child that comes to him because that is resurrecting a dead person to life. The Bible teaches that we were dead in our trespasses of sin, trespasses and sins, and that the Holy Spirit quickens us to life. That's what happens in salvation. That's why you don't hear about the the angels in heaven rejoicing when someone's healed from cancer, but you hear them rejoicing when a dead person comes to life again. And God restores them and he gives them life. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world and they'll not walk in darkness when they receive me anymore. The beautiful truth is Jesus' life He holds and he sustains all things, including you, including me, including your problems, 
including the KDISD dumb stuff that happened today. He is the giver of life and the divine luminance of the universe. And why do I worship him? Because he changes lives. He changed my life and he can make all things new. That's why I worship him. He is worthy of your worship. And when we don't worship him, we don't do it because we're prideful. And Jesus, we just read in Mark that if you are embarrassed or ashamed of him here, he's gonna be ashamed of you. A lot of times we just hold our hands here. We don't worship. We don't wanna get too rowdy or too you know, obnoxious, we think. And uh, that happened with David and he had to get on to his wife. I'm just t- telling you all the Bible. Sit there with your hands folded and prim and proper. And, and Jesus wants adoration. He wants to be adored. He wants to be loved with abandon and a reckless abandon because he loves you with a reckless abandon. He loves you so much he left and made the really dumb business decision of leaving 99 to go after you. And the 99 could have been Taken, wolves, stolen, everything else, but he went after you. Bad business. A good businessman would have said, I'm sorry, man, we just have to count that up. We'll take that as a tax loss. We'll write that off on our taxes. And we'll keep these 99 safe and secure. But that's what he wants from us because he changes lives. And when we worship him, we worship him because he can change our life and he has changed our life. I'll give you an example. Um, I had a young man that was from New Hampshire and um, he used to listen, his fiance listened to my music a lot. Um, And I did, I'd never met them. They'd connected with me over YouTube, then uh, connected on Facebook and I would send them things and um, they happened to be coming through town and uh, she brought her fiance with her and they wanted to meet me and to go to lunch, and, and uh, he said, I want to talk to you about God. I said, great. So we meet at a place called Liberty Burger, and they sell like buffalo burgers and stuff like that. Um, and this guy was a muscled 27, eight-year-old guy, you know, like buff, real buff, good shape, works out every day. You could tell this guy was serious about stuff. And so he starts talking to me about, you know, how true atheism is and how there's no Jesus and et cetera, et cetera. And they always start with the same thing. And so I asked him, I said, so is, is truth something that's real? Is, is truth real? Is there truth? And he said, really, no, there's not. There's, there's things that cultures believe that are true, but every culture is different. And so there is really no one truth. So, for example, what happened in Germany would have been okay because there was no good or evil. It's just dependent. It's voted on. You see what I'm saying, guys? Or um, in the Middle East where rape is winked at or nodded at. Okay? And so, as he was saying that, our food came out. And I just reached over. I grabbed his burger took a big bite out of it, put it back on his plate. And he was aghast. He couldn't believe it. He bowed up on me, and I thought he was going to turn the table over and come at me. And then it hit him what I had done to him. Because you can say you believe something, but you don't live that way. He cannot live the way that Jesus is not real and that truth is not real and that good and evil is not real. That's not the way he lives. He lives as if there's good and and evil and right and wrong. And it was wrong for Tim Hale to grab his buffalo burger and take a big old huge bite and put it back on his plate. And he realized at that moment that he was a hypocrite. He's so busy calling everybody else hypocrites that he doesn't understand that he's the one who's living the hypocritical life saying there's no right or wrong or no good or bad or no truth, but yet that's not the way that he lives. 
And the beautiful part of the story is the man received Christ about three months later. That's the powerful part of how, how Jesus can change lives from somebody who would laugh and mock at God and tell you to your face that there's no such thing as truth. And when someone says there's no such thing as truth, they're saying there's no such thing as Jesus because Jesus claimed to be truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when people say there's no truth, they're saying there's no Christ, there's no Jesus. Think, think that through real quick. Jim Cimbala was one of my favorite pastors, and we're gonna close with this. He preaches at a church in Brooklyn, New York, and um, you guys have probably heard of Brooklyn Tabernacle. They have a lot of uh, great choral stuff, and their choir is world famous, and um, what God has done in their church is unbelievable. It's just unbelievable how God took two um, husband and wife and have used them to turn the world upside down, honestly, with their music and preaching and the gospel message and the the way that they've helped so many thousands and thousands of people through the gospel message and the Holy Spirit. It's been unbelievable. It's been incredible to see. And, and at, taking a lady like Carol Simbola who can't read a note of music and she directs some 300 voice choir, can't read a note, but writes most of their music. There's, there's, a, there's a difference between being talented and gifted. You know what I'm saying? On Easter a number of years ago, he tells this story. He said, I was so tired at the end of the day that I just went to the edge of the platform. It had been five or six services. He was exhausted, unloosened his tie, sat down on the end. And he said, I let my feet dangle. My feet hurt. I didn't want to be up on them anymore, and I sat there on the edge. He said, it was a wonderful service with many people coming forward, getting saved. The counselors were talking with people, praying with people. He says, I was sitting there, I looked up the middle aisle, and there in about the third row was a man who looked about 50 or 60 years old. He was disheveled, and filthy, and I made eye contact with him, and he looked at me sheepishly, like embarrassed that he wanted to talk to me, but he didn't want to bother me at the same time. And I thought to myself, oh, he just, he wants some money to buy alcohol or drugs. And I thought, oh, it's been such a great day, what a horrible way to end. And he said, I'm just gonna give him some money. So he, he got his money clip out and he was pulled a $20 bill out. And he was, as the man came up, he was just gonna ha hand him some money just to be done with the day. Here you go. And he walked up the man walked up. When he got within about five feet of me, Jim says, I smelled a horrible smell like I'd never smelled in my life. It was so awful that when he got close, I had to inhale by looking away from him. Take a breath, talk with him, and look away again to inhale. He said, I asked him, what's your name? And the man said, David. He said, how long have you been on the street? He said, six years. He said, how old are you, David? He said, 32 years old. His hair was matted, front teeth was missing. He said he was obviously alcoholic. Eyes were slightly gay, uh, glazed over. He said, where did you sleep last night, David? He said, an abandoned truck. I want that Jesus you're talking about because I'm not gonna make it. I'm gonna die out here on the street. And Jim Cimbala says, I started weeping. Not for David's situation, but for myself. He said, because here I was gonna give a $20 bill to someone that God had sent to me. He said, I can make the excuse I was tired, but there's no excuse. I was not seeing him the way that God sees him. I was not feeling what God feels about him. All I was thinking was, was his awful smell and how bad he looked. He said, David just stood there and he didn't know what was happening as Jim Cimbala was crying. 
Jim said, I pleaded with God, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry to represent you this way. I'm so sorry. Here I am with my message and my sermon points, and you send somebody, and I'm not ready for them. Please forgive me, God. And something came over him. Suddenly, Jim started weeping deeper, and then David began to cry. David began to weep. And he fell against my chest. And as I was sitting there, he fell against my white shirt and my tie. And I put my arms around him. And there we wept on each other. The smell of this person became a beautiful aroma. And here's what the Lord made real to me. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you. Because this is why I called you where you are. And Christ changed David's life. He started memorizing portions of scripture that were incredible. We got him a place to live. We hired him in the church to do maintenance and we got his teeth fixed. He was a handsome man when he came out of the hospital. They detoxed him in six days. He spent that Thanksgiving at our house, Jim says. He also spent Christmas. And we were exchanging presents. He pulled out a small gift and he said, this is for you. It was a little white wank, uh, white hanky. It was the only thing he could afford. And a year later, David got up and he talked about his conversion to Christ. The minute he took the mic and began to speak, I said, this man's a preacher. And this past Easter, we ordained David. He's associate pastor of a church in New Jersey today. The most beautiful and powerful and potent part of Jesus is that he changes lives. All of the other, his names and they're beautiful and they're majestic and they're royal and he's the creator of the worlds and he's the holder of all things together and everything consists because of him and for his pleasure, for him. Everything consists for him. You consist for him. Everything. All of those are wonderful and they're worthy of our worship, but I'm telling you, to take a dead man or a dead woman and to resurrect them is the most beautiful, majestic, and miraculous event that will ever happen in the universe. And that is why the angels rejoice when a sinner repents and is resurrected from death to life. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is the Jesus who claimed to be God. Every time he used the phrase son of man, he claimed to be God. Every time he uses the word, I am, he claimed to be God. Every time you hear him in the the book of Revelation talk about how his dominion and his authority will never end, he's claiming to be God. He is our God. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. Let's pray. God, we do thank you. Number one, we repent because there are so many people that we would walk right past that maybe you've put in our our way for a reason and for a purpose. And God, I am guilty of that and I repent of that. I pray that we would not be looking just for people who look like us, but we would be looking for people that you have sent into our path. And God, then I ask that we would worship you and adore you in the way that you deserve. You are God. You've claimed it. You've stamped your authority on the entire universe. And your kingdom will never end. And Father, I pray that we would be mindful of that every time we open our mouths direct toward you. That we remember who you are. We would not use your your name flippantly. We would use it with wonder and awe because you are the majestic God of the universe. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.